is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The Grace of Kings, chapters 14, 15, and 16, brought to you by Kyle. In these chapters, a little less fun and lighthearted than the other chapters, we have a bit of self-immolation, not super fun. Got some uh, old men being forced to go back to war after hoping they were done. Don't love that. Um, yeah, this is this is a good section, don't get me wrong, but it is a bit of a bummer. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. And uh, thank you again to Kyle for commissioning another episode so quickly so that I can find out what happened so fast. Um, these chapters, man, the the common theme really seems to be that most people just kind of want to live their lives and don't want to be bothered with all this garbage. But they don't get to do that because life isn't fair and powerful people make you do shit you don't want to do. And it's just a shame to read how many people like are killed or uh, injured or like, you know, traumatized, being forced to do a bunch of shit that is their, quote, duty. But they're like, they see their duty as being more meaningful than we know it is as readers because of the way they're being manipulated. Um, which is fucking true to life, is it not? So I'm not even faulting the book for that at all. Like, that's just how we often assign ourselves a little bit more importance um, because it makes us feel like what we're doing is meaningful and we need that. And in truth, what we're doing may not be meaningful. And it may be like that we are being, as I said, manipulated by somebody who has something very specific to gain from it. And it's sort of a hard thing to like watch happen more than once in these couple chapters with people who are just doing their best to like, you know, be happy with the little that they have. And they are happy with the little that they have. And they feel like they're reaching a, they've reached a point in their lives where this is all they need. And then they are forced out of that. Um, so yeah, I just found this like sort of tragic in this low key way. But the first chapter 14 is a little bit more, uh, hopeful because it's about Kuni and Kuni is doing really well at his job. He is the Duke, um, of Zudi and Duke is sort of a title that has been like just kind of handed to him because it doesn't mean anything as he said to a friend in the last episode, um, a friend who was like, can you believe this asshole over here is calling him King of West Kukru? And he's like, mm, you know who you're talking to, right? Um, and yeah, he is working really hard to make sure that things are operating well, that people are not being taken advantage of, to make sure that like everybody is getting their fair share and being put to use in a way that best utilizes their skills and he appreciates all of the work that people are putting in, even when it's, as it's put here, unglamorous. Um, because that shit is important. There's somebody who's calling me. Get out of here, people. I don't need to hear from you. Um, probably student loan collectors, am I right? But yeah, I really like this whole, the the opening here of him being really hardworking and not feeling resentful about it. You know, his wife is kind of like, maybe you should slow down, my guy. And he's like, why? There's a million people depending on me. And this could be really good if we like, handle it properly. So he's not doing this because he, he wants power. Exactly. He's not doing this because he is being pushed to or forced by anybody. He's doing this because he kind of enjoys caring about people. And I think that that's the most awesome. Um, and the only thing that's kind of marring this for him is the fact that there are some folks who are not, there are some people who aren't paying taxes. 
Um, because, and this is really, really understandable. So two things, people who aren't paying taxes and family members who are not in contact with him, both of them are sort of like using the same logic to justify what they're doing, which is that they believe the rebels are going to be put down shortly and that when they are, they don't want to have been seen supporting somebody who is, you know, uh, basically a ringleader. And also, if you're paying taxes on the um, to a rebel leader and they get overthrown, then all your money that you spent on taxes is going to waste. And that would suck. And for his, you know, family members, they're just basically like, dude, that's, that's a bad look for us. And we're just sort of hoping that once you are inevitably overthrown, that this emperor is going to be more merciful. So, which, you know, honestly, what about the rule of this emperor so far leads them to hope that at all? There is absolutely nothing about the way things have been going that would indicate this guy is more merciful. Yes, is he a child? Sure. But look at his actually, like, his actions. There are a bunch of generals that are dead. There are people being forced into slavery to build this monument and, like, having their hands cut off. Like, all of this stuff speaks to of a person who has absolutely no mercy whatsoever. Um, so, yeah, it's just kind of like... While I do understand his family members' feelings on this, I just don't think they're really using logic. I think it's just really fear, and they're trying to pretend that there's logic in there when there really isn't. Um, Kyle is saying, Kuni, master of civil service. Yes. It just came to me, Kuni has some big Hamilton vibes. I've never seen Hamilton, so I cannot comment on that. Um, but I trust you. So when... Kuni is uh, visited by his mom. I love this. His mom is making him like his favorite foods. And he says something about how he's a grown man and he doesn't need this. And she says a grown man wouldn't give his mother so many heartaches. Just look at how many of my hairs have turned white because of you, which I thought that this was really like sweet, you know. Um, And when Gia says, I've never seen you work so hard. He says, tell me about it. I've cut my drinking down to only at mealtimes. I'm not sure this is healthy. I love that so much. Um, Why do you have to meet with those old peasants? Gia said. The mayor never bothered with him. So much of your work you impose on yourself. Kuni's face turned grave. People used to see me staggering around the streets, hollering and drunk with my friends. They thought I was a callow youth. Then they saw me go to work as a paid servant of the emperor, and they thought I was a boring bureaucrat with no ambition. But they were wrong. I used to think that peasants had little to say, because they had no learning in their minds. I used to think that laborers were crude, because they had no organ for fine feelings in their hearts. But I was wrong. As a jailer, I never got to understand my charges. But when I became a bandit, I spent a lot of time being close to the lowliest of the low. Criminals, the enslaved, deserters, men who had nothing to lose. Contrary to what I expected, I found that they had a hard scrabble, beauty, and grace. They were not mean in their nature, but made mean by the meanness of their rulers. The poor were willing to endure much, but the emperor had taken everything from them. These men have simple dreams, a plot of land, a few possessions, a warm house, conversation with friends, and a happy wife and healthy children. They remember the smallest acts of kindness and think me a good man because of a few exaggerated stories. They've raised me on their shoulders and called me Duke, and I have a duty to help them get a little closer to their dreams. I love this so much because honestly, what this comes down to, and this is something that um, that comes from living in a bad economy feels like a really timid way to say this, but I'm I'm trying to relate this to today because um, I think a lot of us millennials are in this boat where people used to dream when we were children. Our parents used to dream about having mansions and, you know, yachts and whatever. Like the 80s was a time of this sort of like uh, ostentatious wealth that was was like a you know lifestyles of the rich and famous fantasy land 
And nowadays, when you ask people my age what they want, what they'd be happy with, it's so much more modest. I would like, I would like a house like this one with a slightly bigger kitchen and a big bathtub. I would like to not have to pay $450 a month towards my student loans. I would like to be able to go to the doctor when I get sick. I would like to be able to go to the dentist once a year. I would like to be able to afford to get my, you know, contact lens prescription refilled and get new glasses when I need to. We aren't asking for very much anymore because we know how easy, like how much we can get by without things if we have to. So our our desires are fairly modest. It's just, you know, we have lived through such a terrible time in terms of, of wage stagnation and being devalued as employees and not being given benefits or even full-time hours that what we expect has shrunk. The bar is so low. And, you know, in some ways it's nice to have such modest ambitions because of the fact that they feel more attainable. But in another way, it's a really depressing place to be that things that are like in a lot of other countries, just considered life necessities are seen as luxuries, being able to go to the doctor and get glasses, you know? Um, so this, what he's talking about, the fact that he's talking to people who are, you know, not wealthy, who don't have a lot of power and who are in a position that is like what they want and need is going to be so different than people who already have the like necessities that listening to them is going to give him an entirely different perspective and an understanding of what the average person's priorities are really going to be. And I feel like that's really important because if you're asking people to fight for you and if you're asking people to pay taxes for you, you need to show them that their priorities are your priorities as well, or else what motivation do they have to support you? So, I just really like this. And, and she is when Gia is listening to this, she's so proud of him that she's like ready to cry practically. Um, so Rin is trying to convince Kuni to go to Widow Wasu's place. And Widow Wasu is the place in the beginning of the book. Um, we see Kuni as a kid and then we see him as like a teenager and he is so good at bringing people in to her establishment that he gets her to wipe out his, uh, his tab. And now she's sort of like wanting him to come back because it would be good for business. But Kuni is also aware that like, she's not paying full taxes either. Um, And he is tempted to go just because he has been working in such a formal environment that's so sort of outside of his comfort zone. Like he's doing well with it, but it's not relaxed. Um, So he kind of thinks he wants to go. um, But then he thinks like it or not, he was now the Duke of Zudi, no longer the gangster Kuniguru. He could no longer be truly comfortable anywhere. Wherever he was, his new title was part of how people saw him. The widow Wasu wanted him there so that she could claim a bit of the magic of that title too and turn it into drunk customers and jangling copper pieces. Rin was also happily running a business where he accepted people's money in exchange for, quote, access to the Duke of Zudi, and Wasu was probably one of his new clients. Kogo Yelu disapproved of this whole business, but Rin answered him by quoting a classical Anno proverb. No fish can live in perfectly clear water, which I enjoy that quote a great deal. It's sort of like there's no ethical consumers, consumering consumerism under capitalism, um, but just kind of like you just can't you have to allow for these sorts of things in your life. Um 
Cooney agreed that it was important to keep some connections to the world of organized crime, and he also assured Kogo that he did not give the people who paid Rin any undeserved advantages. But he had so much to do. The village elders he met earlier in the day had spoken of the need for repairs to the irrigation ditches. He wanted to review the bid budget from the masons Rin had recommended to be sure that it was fair. Maybe he'd just deal with a few more petitions. Before long, he fell asleep at his desk, and a trail of saliva wet the paper under his face as he dreamed of sweet, hot bowls of sorghum ale. Um, I will never be able to relate to a person who drinks about warm ale, but otherwise... <laughs> I just really enjoy this, you know. He's he's so dead. It's, it, he kind of reminds me of how I feel with the podcast, except obviously the work that he does is more important, but just like this, this vibe overall of me feeling like, Oh my God, I'm so overworked. I have so much to do. And then as soon as I get a chance for a break, I'm like, yeah, but I really want to get this done. And, you know, it's, you know, maybe not I, a lot of people would argue the healthiest way to live and maybe they're right. But also like when you're passionate about something and you really care about something, it can be really hard to prioritize your own mental well-being. Um, so Kogo is talking to Kuni about the state of the tax collecting and the fact that people are afraid that all of their taxes are going to have gone to somebody who's going to be dis deposed really shortly and be essentially taken as like booty for whoever does the deposing. And then uh, they're going to have to pay new taxes to whomever takes his place. So kind of doubling up on taxes. Um, and Kuni is like, first of all, really kind of irritated with the fact that his friend is calling him my lord and tries to be like, dude, do you know who I am? Can you not do this? And Kogo is like, listen, I understand why you aren't super comfortable with this. Don't get me wrong. I get that. But you have to face the fact that if you want to maintain this position and have people's respect, you need to play the role with everybody. You can't you, I really like the uh, the example. An actor playing a king on stage will make the audience believe that he really is king when all his fellow players behave as if he were king and follow the proprieties. But if one of the troop winks at the audience, the illusion is broken. You're the Duke of Zuti now, and it's best if you make it clear that you are in charge no matter who you're talking to. So, you know, he's right. Um, but it is the sort of thing that when you're somebody who has come from humble origins and you hear people calling you this sort of thing, I'm sure it feels like a bit of a farce. And that, I think, is really interesting because it goes to show that the people who are in power and who are okay with being called by the names that they have earned from that power and who don't sense the strangeness of it those people are unaware of how much power is fluid and how much we invent what goes with it. Power is an illusion in a lot of ways. And it's a, an illusion that we all have to agree to in order for it to exist. And somebody like Kuni, who comes from origins that are very, very humble, and is now in this sort of position where people are, you know, uh, making obeisances to him, is aware that just like 10 years ago, y'all would not have been doing this. And because of that, it makes him feel like he's an imposter. Whereas somebody who is born to this sort of role feels like that is simply his due, that that's what you get when you are a ruler. Because that person does not understand that their position is theoretical in a lot of ways. Like, everybody agrees that they are powerful because of their family. And I just find that that self-awareness that Kuni has, while I agree with his friend and I think that he needs to be treated according to the uh, the traditions and, and what's the word, honorifics um, of the time, 
and position that he has, I think it it really is an important indicator of how m- well he understands the mm, the precariousness of his position. And I just find that to be a really interesting, like, I, it could kind of work in your favor or against it. It could make you paranoid because you're aware that your position is so precarious that you begin to covet it and defend against people who would take it from you with a sort of zeal that might not be actually like helpful or appropriate, which we'll see later. Or you can appreciate that it's temporary and try your hardest to work to continually earn it, which is a whole other thing. And that I think is where Kuni is coming from. And I think that's where most public servants should come from. But they don't because they get complacent and start to believe that they simply deserve to be where they are. And Nobody gets somewhere and then gets to coast. Unfortunately, that's not true. Like what I said, nobody gets somewhere and gets to coast is my ideal of how the world would work if it were perfect. But plenty of people get to places and then get to coast. One of them is president of the United States. So, you know, whatever. Um, So what Kogo proposes here is that they organize a lottery to deal with the uh, the people who are not paying taxes. And what it is, is that um, he wants to give, and I think this is such a, an interesting idea, um, people won't be purchasing their lottery tickets directly. Instead, they'll get them only when shopping as a kind of receipt. For each silver piece they spend, they obtain from the vendor a lottery ticket for free. The more they spend shopping, the more tickets they get. And where do the vendors get their tickets? They have to purchase them from us. Cogsy, you rascal. Under this scheme, the vendors won't be able to cook the books because their own customers will be hounding them for the right number of lottery tickets based on what they spend. And since the businesses have to buy the lottery tickets from us, they'll end up paying us fees in proportion to their real revenues just the way taxes were supposed to work. Which, uh, that's pretty genius, to be honest. Like, that's honestly really smart. Um, And I hope that this works. I don't know. I hope it does. But it seems like it will. Because no people don't love anything so much as the lottery, really. It's crazy the amount of money that the lottery brings in every year. Um. And then Kuni did not emulate the Krima Shigin style of military preparation. This is so funny to me. The way his romantic notions of banditry had been dashed made him suspect that peasants swelled up by the momentary joy of having unexpectedly overthrown their Xana masters would be no match for trained imperial troops. It was only a matter of time before the empire recovered from these stumbles and fought for real. Lord Guru, Muru saluted smartly as Kuni showed up at the training grounds. Um, so he goes to, this is so funny. He goes to see, uh, Moon Kukri, who is leading the soldiers in conditioning exercises. This is, I love this so much. I can't, I can't tell you enough. He was stunned by the scene that greeted him now. A fence had been erected around a circular patch of ground and about 50 feet in diameter. Inside, the earth had been doused with water to turn it into a mud pit. Five large pigs squealed and ran around, while ten men, every bit as muddy as the pigs, stumbled after them, struggling to pull their feet out of the thick mud with every step. "'What is going on here?' Cooney demanded. "'Seeing as I'm a butcher,' Kukri said, puffing his chest out proudly, "'my training methods may appear somewhat unconventional.' "'This is training?' Wrestling pigs in mud will develop the men's agility and give them endurance, Lord Guru. As he surveyed the sweaty, mud-coated trainees and loudly squealing pigs, Kukri's bushy beard stuck out all around his mouth like a hedgehog. It will make them ready for the slick tricks of the imperial pigs, too. Kuni nodded and walked away before he broke down in laughter. He had to admit, Moon's madness did have its own logic. (laughs) Which, honestly, I, I like... I really don't disagree, but I hope they're doing more than just pig chasing. But that is so funny. 
And if y'all have run through mud or even like deep sand or water, you know how hard that is. Like that probably is really, really tough. So God bless. It's like doing Zumba in water, you know. Um, I need more horses. He goes to the next guy. And I need a lot of things, but you don't see me complaining about it. You'll have to make do with what you've got. I need more horses, Than said stubbornly. I'm going to start avoiding you if you don't come up with a new theme. For training in more formal tactics, siege craft, and inv- infantry formations, he turned to Lieutenant Dosa, who had been the top-ranking Imperial officer of the garrison at Zudi. Dosa had surrendered after his men dropped their weapons before the rioting citizens of Zudi, and he seemed dedicated to the rebel cause. Kuni didn't exactly trust him, but he felt that he had no choice. No one else on Kuni's staff had gone to military school, after all. That's an interesting development, and I'm going to sit and sort of wait to see what happens there. Um, also, Lieutenant Doza, like the name is spelled D-O-S-A, and my maiden name is D-I-O-S-A, so I kept thinking that it said Diosa, which is my old name, um, and I kept being like, oh my god, Diosa, nope, 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 nope. <clears throat> um, Kuni sent his men on regular patrols of the surrounding countryside to clear it of bandits and highwaymen. By a combination of threats and promises, he recruited many of them into his own army, though Kogo and Rin had to persuade him to hang a few notorious leaders who had killed too often— as examples. He might have plied the outlaw trade once, but that didn't prevent him from now becoming the bandit leader's worst enemy. Again, it was simply a matter of economics. Merchants sold goods and made profits, which generated taxes, which paid for everything else the Duke needed. And none of that would happen if bandits choked off the flow of commerce. Which I really feel like I I get where he's coming from, and it sounds like he's handling it really well, but that is such a delicate line, right, where you realize that that's what you used to do, and everybody has to be completely aware that's what you used to do. So you have to sort of balance the way that you're going to handle it all. Um, So everybody begins the planting. Things are, like, seemingly going pretty well. Um, And that is the problem. He worried. Everything had been going well for him. Too well. He felt sure that this was just a momentary lull before the dam broke. The Empire was going to make its move soon. And yo, do I know that feeling of shit's been going a little too well and something is going to happen. Holy shit, do I know that feeling. When you have had a life where things don't tend to go well, or when you're just not even like that it hasn't gone well, because in most cases, my life has gone pretty well like in in the grand scheme. But when you live a life that's balanced on a knife edge and any little thing can send you flying off into like catastrophe, you just get way too worried when because it feels like the universe tends to balance itself out. And if it's going really well for too long, you know, it's got to come back around. So yeah, I understand that. And I hope that it doesn't go too badly for him. So let's talk about Tenno Nemen. Tenonemon is a soldier who is now old. And what he is retired and enjoying his life going fishing and, uh, you know, just basically living a really simple pared back life and does not want much, does not need much. And the only thing that ever has like sort of motivated him is his love for Zana. And he gets visited by Kindo Morana, who is the bean counter now in charge of the Zana armies. Kindo is too smart. Kindo is doing a good job and goes to somebody who is actually really a great choice for dealing with all of this. And it's frustrating because I don't want Kindo to be good at his job. I want him to fail because I want Zana to be overthrown. But also, I kind of do want Kindo to do well, just because nobody thinks that he's going to do well. And I just like to see the underdog tell everybody to stick it. Um, But what Kindo does is sort of like goads Naman into joining the forces again, this whole thing. The rebels say that Zana has grown indolent. They say that we have gotten used to lives of ease and forgotten how to fight. But some say the Zana has not changed at all. 
They say that the unification happened only because the six states were divided and weak, not that Zana was ever strong and brave. They ridicule tales of the bravery of General Tonietti and General Yuma and call them exaggerations or mere propaganda. So, yeah, he get this he gets this guy like really riled up with this. Um and obviously the problem is that Kindo is like well, the regent has removed many generals he suspects of disloyalty. It has left me with few senior commanders with experience or skill. And I need, indeed I'm desperate for, someone to help stem the tide of the advancing rebels. So, this works. Um, he, you know, once Naman gets sucked in, like his first question is, are the rebels really doing that well? And Kindo is like, oh, yeah, like, they don't look like a lot, but they have a real kind of uh, wave behind them. Um, Our garrisons run for the hills as soon as they see the dust thrown up by the rebel mobs over the horizon. And Naman finally is like, all right, fine. Turns out Naman is really good at what he does. Like, there's a reason that he is still alive after all this time. Um, Naman set sail for the big island. He would assume command of the defenses around Pan and see if the rebels had any weaknesses that could be exploited. So, we go to the territory of Han. Um, there is... The territory of Han has a an area called Rima in it. And... Rima is basically like I I picture Rima as being sort of like a what's what's like Sparta almost. Oh, Han is a different one. Oh, that's weird. Sorry, guys. Kyle's correcting me here um, because the way that this starts off along the northwest coast of the Big Island, the former territory of Han, curled around the shallow and cold Zathan Gulf and still firmly under imperial occupation. The floor of the gulf was rich with clams, crabs, and lobsters, and seasonally, herds of seals came to feast. Moving away from the coast, the land rose gently and turned into a dark forest. The ringwoods, the ancient primeval, roughly diamond-shaped, formed the heart of the resurrected Tiro state of Rima. Okay, the way that's worded, to me, makes it sound like Rima is within Han, Um, but I guess they're just telling us what lands border Rima. Um, landlocked and sparsely populated, it was the smallest and weakest of the seven states prior to the unification. It seemed a bit of a paradox that Fithaweo, the god of war, weapons, and the forge, chose his home here in ring-wooded Rima. Um, so Rima was a warlike kingdom. Um, they, they were really good with a sword They were really good in hand-to-hand combat. But the thing is that as war changed and you had huge armies rather than, you know, skirmishes, um, having the people who are really good and and focused on hand-to-hand combat isn't as valuable as just having a lot of people. So you could have a really beautiful sword and a lot of skill, but if you're up against, you know, 30 dudes with spears, it doesn't matter how skillful you are. You probably are going to die. And um, I thought that this was a really interesting, like, you know, just the description of how a kingdom could have a lot of respect and be really good in... um in warlike situations could sort of fall by the wayside and stop being advantageous in any way when the way that we handle war changes. And yeah, uh, the prowess of the individual warrior became less important. A hundred soldiers fighting with brittle iron spears in formation could still bring down a champion clad in thick armor and wielding a sword of thousand hammered steel. Um, 
Rima's decline was inevitable. It became dominated by Faka, the far more populous state to its northeast, and its once illustrious past became merely a distant memory. The Rima kings turned for solace to ritual and ceremony, keeping alive a dream of greatness that was long dead. Such was the Rima that had been conquered by Zana, and the Rima that was revived. So, yeah, the Rima that was revived is... uh, is similarly clinging to symbols and ritual. Um, So Naman decides to like kind of observe everything that's going on here. And uh, he has 3000 Imperial troops that he, you basically, he sneaks up on Rima. Um, Meanwhile, like there is King Jizu. Jizu had been the son of a man who, when Zana was uh, first conquered Rima, his father surrendered and they were allowed to live like a peasant life. And he really enjoyed that life. Actually. Um, he had been a boy of 16, trying to make a living as an oysterman on the shores of the Zathan Gulf, and his biggest concern was winning the heart of Palu, the prettiest girl in the village. And then soldiers of Fasa came to his hut, knelt down before him, and told him he was now the king of Rima. They draped a robe of silk woven with gold and silver threads over his shoulders, handed him an old Cuban bone inlaid with coral and pearls by the jewelers in misty, salt-kissed Boama, and whisked him away from the sea and from the dark but lively eyes of Palu, eyes that said so much without making a sound. So here he was in Nathion, where the streets were paved with strips of sandalwood laid on a bed of crushed volcanic pumice, and the palace built from the hard ironwood of Rima's mountains seemed as foreign as a palace on the moon. On every street corner there seemed to be a shrine dedicated to one of Rima's ancient heroes, back when the name of Rima still inspired respect and fear on the battlefield. <clears throat> so the thing that he is is having some trouble with here this is before the, the actual attack begins. Je- Jizu is the son of a man who surrendered. And he can tell that a lot of the ministers and the people who are ad- advising him don't respect the fact that his father surrendered. They think that he should have let himself die. And th- so their like respect of him and their support of him is laced with like this little bit of contempt. Um, And he is really aware of it. And he tries to just do what they tell him to do because he doesn't know what he's doing. He's not, you know, he wasn't trained in any of this. So he tries to listen to what his ministers say. um, But he's sort of like, chafed by that, I think, a little bit. Um, And when he's listening to them talk about, like, the men who did just sacrifice themselves, he can't help but feel like, those don't sound like real people. This is like a fairy tale. I understand that y'all, like, kind of respect that, but I do have to wonder how much that's, like, a worthwhile way to end your life. Like, does that make a difference? Um, but he was not stupid. He could tell that King Shuli had helped him reclaim the throne, not simply out of the goodness of his heart. Rima was weak and dependent on Fasa. It deter, it, it, it served as a buffer between the Imperial heartland in Jafika and Fasa itself. Should the new, new Tiro states successfully overthrow the empire, there would be a new contest for dominance and King Shilu would enjoy an advantage in such a contest if he could run things in Nathion by pulling on invisible strings attached to Jizu. Were his ministers really his or did they also listen to orders coming out of Fasa? He could not tell. Um, so yeah, I thought I think that's pretty interesting, and it doesn't wind up being much of a factor so far because of what winds up going down with this guy. But I like all of the, these little political machinations. Um, he did not like his new life, but he felt compelled to accept it. He wished he could return to his days as an oysterman in love with another oysterman's daughter, but his royal blood made that dream impossible. So. Then comes the attack. 
Um, and the attack is such that they actually like have to, the people of Rima have to break apart their homes in order to use the material their houses are built of as like weapons to be thrown at Zana soldiers trying to scale the walls, which really, when you get to a point when you're breaking down your home to throw shit at people, you've lost and it's time to just lose. Like, what are you defending at that point? Um, messenger pigeons sent to seek aid from Fasa when unanswered. Perhaps they were hunted down by trained falcons that the defecting Rima commanders had offered up to General Naman, or perhaps perhaps King Shilu had decided that aid would be wasted because Fasa's young army could not stand against General Naman and his battle-hardened veterans. In any event, no help would be forthcoming. So the ministers start to tell him that he should surrender, to which, obviously, Jizu is like, uh, hey, bitch, y'all were real dicks to my dad. Because he surrendered. And now all of a sudden that it's your life on the line, you get it. And you're really like interested in settling something with these people. Um, and then the friggin' ministers uh, start to say, because Naman winds up damming up the river that flows into the city so that they don't have any water um, and they don't have a way to feed their crops and that they will not have commerce so that everybody will begin to starve to death. Um, these fucking ministers are suggesting shit like maybe we should uh, order some of the citizenry to commit suicide to demonstrate their loyalty. They will conserve supplies for the rest of us. Perhaps some of the women and children can be organized into a siege-breaking unit. We can open the city gates and herd them to rush at the imperial forces. The emperor's soldiers, faced with so many feminine and childish faces, may hesitate, unable to cut them down in cold blood. If they allow the women and children to escape, we can wear disguises and mingle into their number to reach safety. And if they do start killing the women and children, we can retreat and make another plan. Oh my god. Like... He, oh my god yeah he calls it shameful and i'm like yeah that's like a really tame way of saying it because jesus christ it is so fucking like galling that they would even say this shit out loud um so finally king jizu asks to speak with general naman and he says to him i know that you don't want to attack because you don't even want a single one of your soldiers to die but our city is close to death and I could give the order for a desperate counterattack, which I know we will lose, but some of your men will die and your, your name will be despised among the people of the six states for generations as a killer of women and children. Rima is poor in arms and men, but rich in symbols. I am perhaps the best symbol of all. If you wish to make an example to the other rebelling Tiro states, it is enough that you have me. The people of Nathion have resisted you only at my orders. If you spare them, you may win future battles with less resistance and less loss of life. But if you slaughter them, you will only make every city you attack in the future more determined to never surrender. And General Naman says you may not have grown up in a palace, but you're worthy of the throne of Rima. I like this interaction a whole lot. It's just like two men who don't want to fucking be doing what they're doing, which is so tragic to me. And Jizu pledges that uh, he and his ministers will be completely obedient to the emperor and cease all resistance. In exchange, the general won't harm any of the civilians and that Naman will take Jizu as captor and Jesus says he knows he'll be paraded through the city naked, that he will probably be uh, executed in public after torture, or he might be spared depending on what mood the emperor is in that night. Um, so what does he do is he decides like, you know what? I'm definitely going to surrender, but like not how you want. So, he meets General Naman on his knees in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the road, 
and tells him, remember what you promised. I've ceased all resistance and I am at your mercy. Do you agree that this is so? And now you get the symbol you wish for. I will await you on the other side. And he drops his torch and lights himself on fire and dies. Yo, I don't know about you, but if you ask me like the number one way I'm afraid to die, it's probably fire. Dying that way is the worst thing that I can imagine. And it says he screamed and screamed. And I just can't imagine. I just can't imagine. Nope, I don't want to imagine. Just like that. That's some balls right there. And I feel so bad. This was a child. You know, he was 16 when he gets put back. So it, it's just so he he's what, 17 now, maybe? Like, if if that, I don't even know if a whole year passed since. Um, I just feel really bad that he's like a fucking child and he had to kill himself. And it's just really, ah, the whole thing is just such a bummer. Um, he hasn't lived up to his promise, one of Naman's lieutenants said. We can't bring this charred body back to Pan as a trophy and parade it in triumph. Should we slaughter the city? General Naman shook his head. The smell of burned flesh nauseated him, and he felt very old and tired at that moment. He had liked Jizu's pale face, his curled hair, and thin nose. He had admired the way the boy held his back straight, and the way he looked at him, the conqueror, with no fear in his calm gray eyes. He would have liked to sit and have a long talk with the young man, a man he thought very brave. He wished again that Kindo Marana had not sought him out. He wished he were sitting in front of the fire in his house, his hands stroking a contented tozy. But he loved Zana, and love required sacrifices. He has lived up to a promise greater than the one he made to me. The people of Nathion are safe from the sword of Zana today. And the people just sort of are watching him, like, not sure what to make of this. And he says, but load all of Jesus' ministers into prison carts. We'll bring them back to Pon and feed them to the Emperor's menagerie. And the crowd broke into wild, barbaric cheers. Their dancing, pounding feet sent tremors through the ground under the feet of the Zana army. Yo, these people are pissed at those ministers. And they should be, to be frank, because those ministers are cowards and monsters. So I don't feel at all bad, and I feel like Naman is being perfectly fair here. Um... So, chapter 16. We go to Dimu. Um, Dimu is across the river from Dimushi. And Dimu is basically like the farming area where there's a lot more, uh, there's a, a much simpler life and things are a little bit more rustic. And then Dimushi is the really sophisticated city area um, where you can you know, go shopping and find brothels and all of this stuff. And they both are sort of like eyeballing each other and, and resentful of each other. Um, most of the reason there is because Dimu is where King Huno is. Uh, and for those of you who may not remember, King Huno is the maniac who put a message in the belly of a fish and then began to believe that shit. And this fucking idiot. Oh, I can't handle him. Huno Krima. I'm so glad he's dead. Can we just say that? Because spoilers, he gets killed. Thank fuck. Because this guy is a disaster. He is borderline crazy. Like, I, I really think that maybe he has some sort of like, some sort of paranoid, like, I don't know if it's just the, the office creating that, but the fact that he bought into his own, like, fabricated legend makes me feel like this dude is not quite balanced. Um, he, Huno Krima might not have known much about being king, understatement of the year, but he held as an article of faith that a great king had to have a great palace. A Tiro state would not be properly respected unless it had a palace as grand, no, grander than those of the other Tiro states. 
And so the soldiers of West Kakru spent their days not in drills, but in hauling wood and stacking brick, in digging foundations and shaping stone. Faster, higher, bigger, King Huno berated his ministers and architects. Why is the po- progress on the palace so slow? The ministers in, in, uh, insisted to the captains and lieutenants, faster, faster, faster. Um, and then the foreman would scream faster, faster, faster at the laborers. And they were liberal with the use of whips and canes and other methods of amplifying their message. Some of the soldiers began to wonder why they were rebels if what they were doing was pretty much the same as what they'd been doing for Emperor Irushi. Yeah, how about that? Crazy, right? When the king hears this, of course, he is horrified and says that there's a huge difference between laboring unwillingly for a tyrant and fervently contributing to the glory of their liberator. Which, like, dude, when people are being whipped and screamed at and beaten... That's called laboring unwillingly. I don't know what to tell you, but hi. Um, so this motherfucker, this motherfucker here decides that what he's going to do is create like a secret police called the Black Caps to watch over everybody and keep an eye on people who are uh, committing treason in his eyes by saying some shit about how they shouldn't be having to work like this, uh, you know, whatever, whatever. Well, the black caps bring in a lot of traitors because shocking, shockingly, a lot of people have a problem with this King and King Huno starts to be worried at the number of, of uh, traitors and decides that like, well, maybe, Maybe the black caps themselves have been infiltrated. So he creates the white caps. And this isn't even the end of it. He creates the white caps to keep an eye on the black caps. The first man they accused of treason treason was the former captain of the guards, leader of the black caps. The result disappointed King Huno, but he thought it made perfect sense. Just as a fish rots from the head down, corruption started at the top. Of course, the captain of the guards would betray him. So the black caps watched the people while the white caps watched the black caps. But who was going to watch the white caps? This troubled King Huno greatly. He thought and thought and came up with the gray caps. Every solution seemed to create a new problem and King Huno fell into despair. Oh, Lord of mercy. I just love that so much. He just goes so like, ah, oh, it's so great. Um, so again, shockingly, men start to defect. They begin to just or desert. Defect assumes that they're going to the other side, but I don't think they're even doing that. I think they're just fucking bailing. Um, and DeFiro is thinking, and DeFiro, don't forget about uh, DeFiro and Ratho. DeFiro and Ratho were two of the guys that were like there from the very beginning. And DeFiro is saying that maybe they should bail as well. But Ratho was not willing to do that. He still remembered the thrill of the moment he plunged the knife into the Zana soldier, the first man that he had ever killed. King Huno was the one who showed him that he could stand up like a man and take back the life that the empire was going to grind into dust with the same carelessness as the empire crushed stones for the foundation of the mausoleum. King Huno promised that men like Ratho would be able to bring down the empire and avenge his mother and father. Ratho would not forget that. So this concerns me because DeFiro knows which way the wind is blowing and obviously in the end Huno gets killed but like I feel like Rotho is sort of ready to take the guy's place and I wish that he would just go off with fucking Mata because Mata is definitely going to give you what you want Rotho and Mata is better at it so just you know but no he does not the camps at Dimu still had room for 10,000 men, but more than half the bunks were empty that night. Um, and Huno is pissed off that the palace is still not done. And nobody knows how to tell him that, of course, it's starting to go slower than it had before because they don't have as many people working on it anymore. Um, so 
Eventually, they start to like roam around the countryside and forcefully conscript anyone who hasn't run away. And that is exactly what the fucking emperor had been doing. So yes, now he has turned into the exact same thing. Um, deserters who were caught were executed in front of those who remained to instill lessons in loyalty, but this seemed to only make the problem worse, not better. Oh no, really, you think? Um, General, lookout sent aloft in, in battle kites report counting smoke from cooking fires in front of only one of, uh, in front of only one out of every ten tents at dinner time. So Naman is just fucking sitting there waiting because he seems to know that this is how things are going to go with Huno, which I'm really curious, like how he knows this. If he sent people over there to spy and check things out, like he must have, right? Um, or if he's talked to people who bailed on Huno, or I, I'm just really curious because he seemed to just sort of be biding his time waiting for this to inevitably begin to fall apart. And I, I'm curious what got him to the point that he believed it was inevitable and that he could just sort of sit by and wait. Um, as they marched toward Dimu, the Imperial Navy began to bombard the shore with an intensity never before seen by the defenders. The bright arcs traced out by the tumbling buckets of flaming oil were like meteors that lit up the sky, and in their flickering light, swarms of arrows screamed toward the camps where King Huno's last soldiers lay sleeping. It was a rout, pure and simple. Half of West Kakru's soldiers died before they were even fully awake or had put on their armor. The other half tried to put up some resistance and found that they should have spent their days practicing with swords and bows, not chiseling stones and sawing lumber. But it was too late for regret. King Huno grabbed his scepter and the smooth new jade seal of West Kukru. He leapt into his carriage and screamed at his driver to hurry. They had to get out of Dimu right away and go back to Karusa, where King Thufi would have to give him command of the rest of the rebel forces so that he could avenge this humiliating defeat. It's not fair, he fumed. The righteous hatred that his men shared for Zana could have, should have made them invincible. So here he's having like the exact conversation with himself that Kuni was having. Kuni was like, oh yeah, hatred isn't enough to keep them going forever. They need to be trained. And he's too stupid to fucking realize that. The only explanation was that his troops had been betrayed by cowards hidden within their ranks. He lost only because the imperial general, that decrepit, decrepit and crafty Naman, had too many dirty tricks and spies. Ah, so he's yelling at his driver to keep going and do it faster. And his driver does not. And finally, he turns around and tells him, So, I was one of the first ones to join you in Shigin. And of course, the first thing that Ho that uh, Huno says is don't speak of Shigen as though he were my equal. And this guy just interrupts him. Ten days ago, my brother got sick and his chief would not let him rest because he had to work on your palace. So he fainted in the heat and a foreman whipped him until he died. Did you know about this? King Huno had no idea what this man was babbling about, but he caught another mistake in his manners. You must say your majesty when you speak to me. Now hurry up and get me out of here. Oh, Huno, bless your, bless your dumbass heart. You just don't know how to read a room. I don't think so, your majesty, Kimo said. He yanked on the reins so that the carriage lurched to a sudden stop, tumbling King Huno out of his seat. Then, with a swift stroke of his sword, Kimo severed Huno Krima's head from his shoulders. He turned east and rode toward Karusa, where Mata Zindu, another son of Tanoa and already a legend, had ridden with Refiroa. So then we have the gods talking amongst themselves. Um... And some of them admitting that they definitely underestimated Marana and Naman. And uh, the, gloat all you want, brother. Puff up like one of your airships. The one laughing the last will be the one laughing the loudest. My heart is gladdened to see you, King Thufi said, as he welcomed Finn and Mata Zindu at the gates of Karusa. Kokru desperately needs a true marshal. And that is the end of the chapter. So, y'all, 
It's about to happen. Mata is about to come into his shit. I am really eager for it, to be honest. Like, after seeing how fucking inept Huno was, I'm so glad he's dead. Y'all don't even know. Um, <laughs> Kyle is quoting, you've gone mad with power. Well, have you tried going mad without power? It's boring. No one listens to you. That's from The Simpsons, right? I think I remember that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, this is just like, Finally starting, I, I really enjoy like the grace of Kings is the title of the book, but I really underestimated how many Kings there were going to be. There's a lot, there's a lot coming in and out, um, revolving door of kingship. But I really want my ideal here is for Mata to team up with Kuni. I'm hoping that's what happens because they each represent like what you need, right? You need somebody who's really good, um, he, he what he, what it should be is that Mata, Mata can be king, but Kuni can be his like chatelain or whatever you want to call it, the person who manages things. That's what I want, um, because I don't feel like Kuni needs to be the guy. Mata is obviously so impressive and and like legendary in appearance and deed that he needs to be the figurehead, but Kuni. Organizing behind a guy like that, he would do a lot. Could do a lot. Um, so, yeah, I like it. I think that should be how it goes. I don't know how Finn would feel about Kuni doing that, though. Finn, you're getting old, though. Somebody needs to take your spot eventually. Anyway, all right, I'm wrapping this up. Um, thank you again to Kyle for commissioning this and for coming to the Crowdcast. Thank you to Melanie also for coming. Um, I don't think she's here anymore, but thank you for coming initially. And I hope that you guys are enjoying this coverage. Make sure to um, to check out unspoiledpodcast.com slash shop if you would like to commission anything. And I will be seeing you all soon, hopefully, with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>